We are absolutely thrilled to be here and have each of you here. My name is, is this okay? Can you hear me okay? My name is El Panier Hudson, and I have the honor of serving here at Florida International University as the Senior Vice President for Human Resources and Vice Provost for the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And I could not be uh, more excited. This has been an amazing week. We, on um, yesterday, our Board of Trustees unanimously voted our president, uh, Kenneth A. Jessel, as the sixth president of this university. Would you celebrate that? <laughs> and we wanted to keep the celebration going, so we coordinated this. <laughs> Divinely ordered, but coordinated this day, a great day to celebrate two amazing Panthers who I'd like to say, right, who I'd like to say by way of Columbia University, how amazing is that? Everything is just so incredibly ordered. And um, uh, just celebrating um, the launch of uh, not only uh, an amazing uh, book, but we're talking about a convergence of mindfulness and diversity, equity, and inclusion concepts that were just so intricately put together that you'll get to experience uh, today. And so I'm so excited about that. But also, these individuals uh, particularly, I want you to know, and the world should know, and I hope this is recorded, we're gonna amplify it all over, but the world should know that uh, Gloria Johnson Cusack was an architect for the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here, the work that's been done that we're experiencing here at FIU. So could you celebrate that? Could you celebrate that? That's a big deal. And say Anne. Anne. Chris is a member of the Diversity Council subcommittees. Come on, put your hands together for that. That's a big deal. And so today we're gonna to peek into some amazing work. And I know that we have family and friends here. We'll, you'll introduce them at a, at a point. But we want to um, celebrate and applaud this great work that is continuing to uh, establish what we call DEI transformation, right? This is not a moment in time. This is a movement that is going to continue to transform the work that's not only done here, but it's gonna emanate from FIU. So I'm excited about this book that helps us tell the story, excited about this book that it helps us um, elevate the great work that's being done in this space. And so at this moment, I'm going to invite to your front my colleague, Vice, Pre Vice Provost, Vice President, I'm sorry, Pablo Ortiz, to greet you at this time. Thank you, E.K., and good morning, everyone. Good morning. It really is a pleasure to be here uh, this morning uh, and an honor to have been invited to participate in this conversation uh, a conversation I know that we have had here at the university over the last number of years in really focusing in as, uh, at, on our culture, our approach uh, to diversity, equity, and inclusion here at the university. And I certainly look forward to the conversation today. But for me, I, I first want to thank Chris and Gloria for filling my brain and my head with thoughts and emotions and frustrations and conflicts and stress late at night as I read through this book. Uh, so, so mission accomplished. I think that's why you wrote this book. Um, but really, uh, for me, this book highlights a very important aspect in terms of our next steps, uh, not just as an institution, because I think that's a very narrow focus in terms of the importance of this conversation, but really as a society, right, as a community, uh, in terms of our ability to be willing to self-govern ourselves. Uh, we talk a lot about shared governance in higher education. We talk a lot about governance in general, but sometimes we overlook the importance of self-governance and really understanding what our own thoughts and beliefs, experiences, our history, our biases, and how all of those things influence our day-to-day -day activities and our day-to-day -day conversations. Uh, so for me, this was a great opportunity to just stop, as the book shows, uh, and take a moment to, to recognize some of those unearned advantages that, that I've been uh, privileged to have um, and as well as how those unearned advantages have also guided me in my interactions throughout my career. I can tell you the man that I was at 20 years old is very different than the man I am today at 50 something. <laughs> <clears throat> but I will say this, that as I read through the book, um, I found myself jumping into my administrative role and wanting to find a solution right away. And I think that happens a lot of times uh, in organizations and institutions that are having this very 
delicate and important conversation, right? It's, it's not a moment in time, as E.K. mentioned, but it really is a process of changing an entire culture, uh, individual by individual. And oftentimes, as administrators, we think, well, we can just impose a solution, a top-down approach to fixing things, uh, where, in fact, that actually complicates it a bit more and, and could make it worse. Uh, so this has been a, a great opportunity. I didn't want to take up too much time up front. I know that there may be some Q&A and some opportunities to talk a bit further. Uh, but it really is an honor uh, for me to be here. I serve as the Vice President for Regional and World Locations, uh, an interesting position because it, it really has us looking at a much broader uh, base of, of influence that we have as a university, not just here in Miami, but really around the world, um, as we have agreements with over 230 partners worldwide, um, as well as the Vice Provost of the Biscayne Bay Campus. So even just going across the county um, and serving in that community, you realize the difference uh, that our own learned experiences and our unearned uh, advantages uh, play a role in, in what we do and how we operate. So looking forward to the conversation. Um, I'm, I'm here for, for any tough questions or any thoughts that you may have. Uh, but at this time, it's my privilege to introduce uh, my coworker, my colleague, um, who has been charged with a very difficult, difficult task, right? And that is how to really operationalize some of what we're talking about, right? Because it's easy to talk about it. Uh, at times, but really where you take that from, from talk to action uh, is where uh, a lot of times organizations fail. And, and I know that she leads a lot of that effort across the university. So it's my, it's my uh, privilege to introduce uh, Bridget Cram. She's the uh, Interim Vice President for Innovative Education and Student Success. So her and I work very, very closely together as well in terms of ensuring our student success uh, throughout their experience here at the university. So with that, Bridget, good morning. Thank you, Pablo. And like Pablo, I'm so honored to be here today to celebrate the release of this really important book. Um, I did want to say our provost sends her regrets for not being here today. I know that she would have loved to be here today and celebrate, um, but I do ask that you all keep her in your thoughts as she has recently uh, lost her mother this past weekend. So most of my work here at FIU is focused on student success. And when I read the book and reflected on the concepts of earned and unearned privilege, that resonated with me. Because a lot of the work that we do is working with students to develop social capital, cultural capital, so that once they graduate from FIU, they can truly be successful. But in addition to that, focusing on right, the concept of self-governance, emotional intelligence, that self-awareness, so that in addition to being professionally prepared, they're also prepared to do the important work that this book really speaks to. Outside of my student success work, much of my research has also focused on cultural competency development, especially in the public sector. And for some of you that do not know, uh, in public administration, we have the four E's. Effectiveness, efficiency, economy, and equity. Equity was introduced much later than the other three uh, in the late 1960s. And unfortunately, we are 54 years later, and unless you actually ask if somebody has taken equity into account, it is not the first E that people think about. I've had the opportunity to develop a course in the program on cultural competency, and what I can say is that even though this topic is often uncomfortable, our students are willing to engage. And when I was speaking uh, this morning with Gloria and with Heather, um, what I was reflecting on is this book is really important because it offers folks that may be uncomfortable directly engaging, it offers them language that helps them ease into that conversation and helps students see this from a different perspective. And even though it can be uncomfortable, the students help you get there. The students want to have the conversations. Our students want to make a difference. And at the end of the day, I know here at FIU, our staff, our faculty want to make a difference as well. So I'm excited to put into practice some of the things I've learned uh, to make, help make that difference even more. But what's really important, right, is the understanding that policies impact people. And if we take a moment to reflect, which this book asks us to do constantly, um, we can make a difference to when it comes to practices or policies and understanding the disproportionate impact they may have on some people than others. And I think that's really important, not only from a higher ed administrator, um, but as a public servant, how are we really reflecting about how our actions impact people? And when you boil it down, which again, through the book, it makes it really simple to make those connections, 
It is about people. Put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Reflect. Ask those questions and think about what the outcome is before you make that you know, initial decision. Um, and to me, right, those moments that I have with my students, that I've had with my colleagues, really show that we can be successful if we are intentional, intentional, oh my gosh, intentional, intentional, we'll make that a new word, uh, about how we make space for those critical conversations. Um, and really, at the end of the day, the real question is, what is the cost of equity, and are we willing to rethink how and why we do things to make sure cost never gets in the way of doing the right thing, right? Those other four E's are all about getting the job done as quickly and as cheaply as possible. And when we think about equity and how we have to redesign systems to make sure that that can be a real outcome, that there is a cost to that. And we should really think about how we reprioritize our goals to make sure that that is not an obstacle. As we think about our roles, whether it's a manager, leader, student, or professor, we have opportunities each day to develop the skills outlined in this book. Whether that's through deepening our reflection, rethinking how and who we reach out to in terms of mentoring or coaching, uh, or not being afraid to show concern or advocate when we see a policy or practice uh, that will have disproportionate impact. And really, to me, this book is about showing that there's space to constantly develop and that you can make progress step by step. You don't have to be perfect on your first try, but you have to be willing to try to get there. And as the book states, growth is uncomfortable. We need to find the places and the space to ask those difficult questions, to reflect on our own advantage, and develop with intentionality the programs and spaces that foster a culture where we can have that growth advantage mindset. So again, congratulations. I love the book, um, and I really look forward to hearing more from both of you. I'm just going to say that uh, this is an easy thing to do for us because we're no, we know we are in a room of allies. These people that just spoke are allies in the dimensions of power that matter the most. They're lending their voice and their heart and their resources and cashing in on a bit of that asset which is about advantage for the good of all. And it's not a coincidence that it's a beautiful rainbow of people who have presented uh, to you today. And we thank you in advance for your being here. We know we are in a receptive room where you're rooting for us. So uh, I'll also say that as we do this reading and as we have further conversation, we're going to open it up and allow you to ask whatever kinds of questions you wish. You are going to notice a certain temperament from me and Chris, which is that we are goofy and joyful. So, yes, we are mindful that we are in an environment of divisiveness and where things are hard. And yet we bring great joy to this work because we have seen the principles that are captured in this book work. And so if you are kind of grumpy about being overly, you know, enthusiastic about what the world is like, you're just going to have to come along with us and uh, see what we can do together. Okay, so we're reading from the prologue. And as many of you may know, this book is uh, very much powered by archetypes, somewhat fictional characters uh, who we have designed to allow people to have these conversations and do the kind of work that you've heard described, but in a way that might be more comfortable than always using our I voices. And so there's a little method to the madness, and this is some of what you're going to get here. So now you have to imagine I'm a white guy. I'm reading that part. <laughs> Thank God that's over, thought Robert. The mandated session on diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, had crumbled to a close, and participants made their way out of the room without any discussion. Robert had hoped the session wouldn't be the complete waste of time his work friends had warned him about, but it seemed destined to go sideways from the start. This privileged thing, he later told a friend, it's crap. I earned what I have and no one can tell me different. Maria also left the session unhappy, not so much angry as conflicted. I'm feeling confused about what should be a simple thing, she thought. Maria had always known that she was treated differently than the friends she knew as a child in Venezuela. 
because her skin and her hair were lighter than theirs and because she came from a family of means. I guess that helps me, but am I supposed to feel bad? I can't help how I was born. Now, if I were born a brother instead of a sister, I'd be doing even better. If one more person asks me to explain what it's like to be black in America, I'm just going to collapse. Yvonne was exhausted again. Her entire working life, Yvonne had always been one of the few minority females in the room and felt a spotlight on her each time discussions about equality came up. Most of the time, they, those asking, mean well, but it's like they're asking a question in English, but hearing my answer in a foreign language. They just can't understand what I'm saying. And Alvin? Alvin was familiar with the concepts and terms used in the program and with some of the reactions of the others. We studied, race, we studied issues of race, history, and social justice in school, he said. But at school, it was easier to talk about it. It seemed like each of us could be who we are without posing to be someone else. The working world doesn't feel like that. And since this COVID thing, I think some people are, seem to be avoiding me. After the seminar, the facilitator sighed. It's like driving a bus with 10 different GPS systems, each giving me different routes while randomly screaming, recalibrating route. This facilitator could relate to all four of these participants, upset, confused, exhausted, and afraid to share that she didn't have the correct GPS route herself. Ah. Everybody's like, ooh. Question, uh, and I'm going to take advantage of that question to step into why this book. So I had the fortune of meeting this wonderful lady in the DEI Policy Committee for FIU. And at that point, the idea of a book of writing around privilege was definitely percolating. For me, the reality of, uh, and I would written about it some years earlier, is like, can mindfulness help with privilege? Eh, interesting conversation, but then... George Floyd, then the litany of all the different challenges and justices and horrific things that we've seen. That's what prompted this conversation. And this conversation around privilege, so I'll take the opportunity now to privilege doesn't work. Because when you have it, white, male, straight, extroverted, able-bodied, if I was three inches taller, <laughs> I'd have it all. <laughs> She's wearing her heels, so I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to help you out, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so that's when you have it, you don't want to talk about it. I don't want to. It, no, don't bring this up. And no, no, no. And it's a, everybody has equal opportunity. And I'm colorblind, and all these other things that people like to say that I, Robert, used to say. If you don't have privilege, or have less, my co-author has less than I do, you are exhausted and incensed by that reality. So if you have it, you don't want to hear about it, and if you don't have it, you're tired of hearing about it. So we said, no, what, you know what, let's talk about advantage. Let's talk about earned advantage, the idea that people can earn things in this life, who feel like, you're saying I should feel guilty because I'm white. Let's change the conversation. Let's talk about you can earn things in this life through hard work and through the grace of whoever your God is and your talents and your skills. Any one of us can earn things. So can we take a breath on that? It's a very uh, good book uh, to read. I think it's uh, very important uh, because we are very committed to DEI. We are very focused on DEI initiatives. Last week I had six town hall meetings, uh, so six different uh, sessions with students, faculty, staff, outside groups and the like. And I think at every session, DEI came up as a talking point. And indeed, even yesterday at the Board of Trustees meeting, that was one of the questions uh, that they asked me. Am I committed to DEI? Yes. And do we have programs in place to ensure that we meet our goals and objectives of having a university community that is reflective 
of the populations that we serve. And that is absolutely our goal. We are going to measure, we are going to manage, we're going to monitor our progress, we're going to adjust where necessary if we have to revise our recruiting process, if we have to adjust our sign-on process, if we have to adjust how we allocate positions to ensure that we meet our, meet our goals, uh, we are going to do that. Because meeting our goals is good for everyone. I particularly like the fact that we're referring to, you know, earned advantage. And I think everyone here has the same goal. Any job that you have, any position that you have, it's based upon what you have earned. Not what you did in the past, not where you're from, what was your zip code, et cetera, but what you have actually been able to earn and to show and document as your ability to contribute to FIU and meeting our noble uh, mission. So I love that terminology because it really takes us out of that, that, that word of, of, uh, of privilege and gets us to really what is part, in my view, of the American dream. And if you think about, you know, uh, America, and you think the last three or f the last four letters, I can. That's part of the American dream. So we want to make sure everyone has that opportunity and everyone advances on the basis of their hard work and their contribution. So thank you for, for writing the book. It's certainly nice to see uh, both of you. And it's, it's been a while that, that you and I have had a conversation. And I appreciate everyone being here today to reaffirm your commitment to DEI. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So uh, I would like, Chris, please come. I would like to take a liberty, because it's our book and our day, so <laughs> to thank you for who you are and what you do, and in that order. Well, thank you. Uh, I met Dr. Jessel when he was the chief financial officer, mm -hmm. and then he became the interim president and now has just been approved as the permanent one. And on many occasions, we had standing meetings. He talked about his calendar, where there was a certain amount of time where we would share thoughts. And it wasn't me reporting to him or him reporting to me. We, were, we always went over because of his intention and his heart and his mind. And I remember when I first met him, I thought, I said to the then president, that he's unlike any CFO I ever met. He was thinking so broadly thinking the same way, expressing the same intention that he does now. And I'm just so excited and thrilled, not surprised about this new season in your life. I'm not surprised that you're here, even though I know you have a gazillion other things you could be doing. And I just want to thank you so much for what you have done and what you will do. We don't take it for granted. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Please join me and thank you. I want to hug him, but I guess that might not be professional in the setting. <laughs> Uh, you can hug me. Okay, okay, okay. There go. There go. There go. <laughs> so much for inclusion. And we understand, uh, Dr. Jessel, if you have to leave, we appreciate you so much. All right, see, there you go, there you go. So one of the things that um, Chris and I thought would be important to share uh, before we um, open up the, the room for um, any further discussion, and then we will sign some books, and some of you have been doing interviews, um, is to also share... Um, our intentions about three things, and some of these have been alluded to, but just for the sake of those of you who may not have had uh, the opportunity to read the book, we just wanted to emphasize three intentions that we hope you will capture uh, and be able to pass on in your spheres of influence. Uh, one is our intention to make sure that we are meeting people where they are. Uh, as one of our, our speakers said in an informal uh, conversation we were having, there's no ideal audience member. There's not some know-it-all. We don't want to be preaching to the converted, and we also don't want to be doing shame or blame. Chris often says our intention is to stoke action, not fire. We want to meet people where they are so that they can come alongside us. Our other intention is to make sure that we stay focused on the why of inclusion, the why of increasing earned advantage for all. For many of us, there are different reasons. The why could be about having stronger families, stronger communities, more productivity in our, in our businesses, higher effect, bigger effect in our communities, 
stronger advocacy and policy and, and practice in all of our spheres of influence. Some of us may be motivated just by our own internal need to be better and to do better, to not curse the darkness around all of the negativity that's out there, but in, instead to bring light in whatever spheres of influence we have. And so we, our intention is to meet people where they are in that domain. And then finally, I think it's important for us to convey how very important it is for all of us after reading this book and internalizing it to feel comfortable passing it on, to passing it on. All of us, wherever we sit, have power. We have influence. And our hope is that you will feel comfortable sharing this tool in a way that is empowering and that invites people in instead of calling them out. We know there are lots of historical reasons, present reasons, why there is inequity. There are vested interests in making sure that it remains that way. Okay, this book is the what now. It's not what's happened, what's happening, it's what's now. What do I do now? And so we have a certain attitude of impatience and urgency uh, as Chris mentioned, I haven't had to walk around saying, well, my goodness, I, George Floyd happened. I wonder what that's all about. You know, as a person who is a woman of African-American and Halawasapani indigenous uh, ancestry, I am reminded every day, my family, my circle is reminded every day about the unearned advantage that is so prevalent. And so as a person who has worked in all sectors, business, education, higher ed, nonprofit sector, and now philanthropy, I'm finding ways to try to build bridges because I have spent my lifetime thinking and working and trying to effectuate change, whether they called it DEI or not. And the fact that now we are able to come alongside each other with Chris as a journeyman who originally conceptualized the whole framework of this earned and unearned advantage and pulling it all together. I want to just say that this is a proud and exciting moment for us. I want to thank you, Chris, before we go to all of the business stuff, for being such a gracious leader coming alongside me and helping me grow. We are excited because I get to see this happen. I work with foundations. I have sat in a room, a boardroom, of a very power, powerful foundation where a very high-level banker of that board said, I don't understand, like I'm white male, of course, I do not understand how we got here as a country. I don't completely understand how we can solve the problem. But I have confidence that because we have taken time to do what you see here, to reflect and listen, and to change, Bridget, our policies and practices and alignment of resources so that we're listening to the people with unearned advantage, that our grant making should be different. We don't have to figure it all out to be able to move, and that's what I've heard all of you say. We, we come to this with a, a spirit of humility. And so we hope that that intention is clear to you, and we hope that that sets up the frame for any conversations or questions that you might have at this time. Is there anything else? We believe that each of us are our own best teacher. Wherever you are, whoever you are, wherever you're from, we teach ourselves best. So the approach of this book and the approach that we espouse is not to lecture from above and not to direct on what should and should not be, but to ask better questions. So rather than make more powerful statements, ask better questions. In the spirit of that. OK. In the spirit of that, he's telling me I need to do an exercise with you because we felt very strongly that, again, instead of talking about it, we want you to experience it. Um, so It's not too long. It's a little short one, and you don't have to like do anything hard. All right, so just roll with us. It's a short one. This is around understa understanding the sources of unearned advantages. Take a moment to settle yourself in a comfortable but alert position. Practice the breath exercise we introduced at the beginning and give yourself a minute. So breathe in 
and out. Recall or imagine walking into a meeting room, a cafeteria, or another place where people gather. Each table has an open seat. Recognizing we are rarely thinking about what's happening consciously, what influences where you choose to sit? After thinking about this, consider this question. What really influences where you choose to sit? Allow yourself to explore your answers. Now, take another breath, perhaps this time allowing a fuller exhalation than the first time. Take a breath. Exhale. Notice if you sense any emotional reactions to these questions and your answers. Do you find yourself annoyed, defensive, validated, or a bit uncertain? See if you can observe your reaction as if you were removed from you and sit with it. The whole book's like that. Because <laughs> that's the idea. The right answers are within each of us. Meeting people where they are instead of telling them where they should be, we feel is the right approach. So we hope that as you have an opportunity to explore the book, explore the elephant, uh, that you'll find that to be true. At this point.